Chapter Eight of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Taking of Mr. Stewart. They were still sitting over the supper table at the hall. The sun had set about the time they had begun, and the twilight had deepened into dark. But they had not cared to close the shutters, as they were to move so soon. The four candles shone out through the windows and there still hung a pale glimmer outside owing to the refraction of light from the white stones of the terrace beyond on the left there sloped away a high black wall of impenetrable darkness where the yew hedge stood over that was the starless sky sir nicholas study was bright with candlelight and the lace and jewels of lady maxwell for her sister wore none added a vague pleasant sense of beauty to mr stuart's mind for he was one who often fared coarsely and slept hard he sighed a little to himself as he looked out over this shining supper-table past the genial smiling face of sir nicholas to the dark outside and thought how in less than an hour he would have left the comfort of this house for the grey road and its hardships again it was extraordinarily sweet to him for he was a man of taste and a natural inclination to luxury to stay a day or two now and again at a house like this and mix again with his own equals instead of with the rough company of the village inn or the curious foreign conspirators with their absence of educated perception and their doubtful cleanliness he was a man of domestic instinct and good birth and breeding and would have been perfectly at his ease as the master of some household such as this with a chapel and a library and a pleasant garden and estate spending his days in great leisure and good deeds and instead of all this scarcely by his own choice but by what he would have called his vocation he was partly an exile living from hand to mouth in lodgings and inns and when he was in his own fatherland a hunted fugitive lurking about in unattractive disguises he sighed again once or twice there was silence a moment or two there sounded one note from the church tower a couple of hundred yards away lady maxwell heard it and looked suddenly up she scarcely knew why and caught her sister's eyes glancing at her there was a shade of uneasiness in them it is thundery to-night said sir nicholas mr stuart did not speak lady maxwell looked up quickly at him as he sat on her right facing the window and saw an expression of slight disturbance cross his face he was staring out on to the quickly darkening terrace past sir nicholas who with pursed lips and a little frown was stripping off his grapes from the stalk the look of uneasiness deepened and the young man half rose from his chair and sat down again what is it mr stuart said lady maxwell and her voice had a ring of terror in it sir nicholas looked up quickly eh eh he began the young man rose up and recoiled a step still staring out i beg your pardon he said but i have just seen several men pass the window there was a rush of footsteps and a jangle of voices outside in the hall and as the four rose up from table looking at one another there was a rattle at the handle outside the door flew open and a ruddy strongly built man stood there with a slightly apprehensive air and holding a loaded cane a little ostentatiously in his hand the faces of several men looked over his shoulder sir nicholas ruddy face had paled his mouth was half open with dismay and he stared almost unintelligently at the magistrate mr stuart's hand closed on the handle of a knife that lay beside his plate in the queen's name said mr frankland and looked from the knife to the young man's white determined face and down again a little sobbing broke from lady maxwell it is useless sir said the magistrate sir nicholas persuade your guest not to make a useless resistance we are ten to one the house has been watched for hours sir nicholas took a step forward his mouth closed and opened again lady maxwell took a swift rustling step from behind the table and threw her arm round the old man's neck still none of them spoke 
come in said the magistrate turning a little the men outside filed in to the number of half a dozen and two or three more were left in the hall all were armed mistress margaret who had stood up with the rest sat down again and rested her head on her hand apparently completely at her ease i must beg pardon lady maxwell he went on but my duty leaves me no choice he turned to the young man who on seeing the officers had laid the knife down again and now stood with one hand on the table rather pale but apparently completely self-controlled looking a little disdainfully at the magistrate then sir nicholas made a great effort but his face twitched as he spoke and the hand that he lifted to his wife's arm shook with nervousness and his voice was cracked and unnatural sit down my dear sit down what is all this i do not understand mr franklin sir what do you want of me and who are all these gentlemen won't you sit down mr franklin and take a glass of wine let me make mr stewart known to you and he lifted a shaking hand as if to introduce them the magistrate smiled a little on one side of his mouth it is no use sir nicholas he said this gentleman i fear is well known to some of us already no no sir he cried sharply the window is guarded mr stewart who had looked swiftly and sideways across at the window faced the magistrate again i do not know what you mean sir he said it was a lad who passed the window there was a movement outside in the hall and the magistrate stepped to the door who is there he cried out sharply there was a scuffle and a cry of a boy's voice and a man appeared holding anthony by the arm mistress margaret turned round in her seat and said in a perfectly natural voice why anthony my lad there was a murmur from one or two of the men silence called out the magistrate we will finish the other affair first and he made a motion to hold anthony for a moment now then do any of you men know this gentleman a pursuivant stepped out mr franklin sir i know him under two names mr chapman and mr woad he is a popish agent i saw him in the company of dr story in antwerp four months ago mr stuart blew out his lips sharply and contemptuously pooh he said and then turned to the man and bowed ironically i congratulate you my man he said in a tone of bitter triumph in april i was in france kindly remember this man's words mr frankland they will tell in my favour for i presume you mean to take me i will remember them said the magistrate mr stuart bowed to him he had completely regained his composure then he turned to sir nicholas and lady maxwell who had been watching in a bewildered silence i am extremely sorry he said for having brought this annoyance on you lady maxwell but these men are so sharp that they see nothing but guilt everywhere i do not know yet what my crime is but that can wait sir nicholas we should have parted anyhow in half an hour we shall only say good-bye here instead of at the door the magistrate smiled again as before and half put up his hand to hide it i beg your pardon mr chapman but you need not part from sir nicholas yet i fear sir nicholas that i shall have to trouble you to come with us lady maxwell drew a quick hissing breath her sister got up swiftly and went to her as she sat down in sir nicholas chair still holding the old man's hand sir nicholas turned to his guest and his voice broke again and again as he spoke mr stuart he said i am sorry that any guest of mine should be subject to these insults however i am glad that i shall have the pleasure of your company after all i suppose we ride to east grinstead he added harshly to the magistrate who bowed to him then may i have my servant sir presently said mr frankland and then turned to anthony who had been staring wide-eyed at the scene now who is this a man answered from the rank that is master anthony norris sir ah and who is master anthony norris a papist too no sir said the man again a good protestant and the son of mr norris at the dower house 
Ah, said the magistrate again, judiciously. And what might you be wanting here, Master Anthony Norris? Anthony explained that he often came up in the evening and that he wanted nothing. The magistrate eyed him a moment or two. Well, I have nothing against you, young gentleman, but I cannot let you go till I am safely set out. You might rouse the village. Take him out till we start, he added to the man who guarded him. Come this way, sir, said the officer, and Anthony presently found himself sitting on the long oak bench that ran across the western end of the hall at the foot of the stairs, and just opposite the door of Sir Nicholas' room, where he had just witnessed that curious, startling scene. The man who had charge of him stood a little distance off and did not trouble him further, and Anthony watched in silence. The hall was still dark except for one candle that had been lighted by the magistrate's party, and it looked somber and suggestive of tragedy. Floor, walls, and ceiling were all dark oak, and the corners were full of shadows. A streak of light came out of the slightly opened door opposite, and a murmur of voices. The rest of the house was quiet. It had all been arranged and carried out without disturbance. Anthony had a very fair idea of what was going forward. He knew, of course, that the Catholics were always under suspicion, and now understood plainly enough from the conversation he had heard that the reddish-haired young man, standing so alert and cheerful by the table in there, had somehow precipitated matters. Anthony himself had come up on some trifling errand and had run straight into this affair, and now he sat and wondered, resentfully, with his eyes and ears wide open, there were men at all the inner doors now they had slipped in from the outer entrances as soon as word had reached them that the prisoners were secured and only a couple were left outside to prevent the alarm being raised in the village these inner sentinels stood motionless at the foot of the stairs that rose up into the unlighted lobby overhead at the door that led to the inner hall and the servants quarters and at those that led to the cloister wing and the garden respectively the murmur of voices went on in the room opposite and presently a man slipped out and passed through the sentinels to the door leading to the kitchens and pantry he carried a pike in his hand and was armed with a steel cap and breastpiece in a minute or two he had returned followed by mr boyd sir nicholas body servant the two passed into the study and a moment later the dark inner hall was full of moving figures and rustlings and whisperings as the alarmed servants poured up from downstairs then the study door opened again and anthony caught a glimpse of the lighted room the two ladies with sir nicholas and his guest were seated at table there was the figure of an armed man behind mr stewart's chair and another behind lady maxwell's then the door closed again as mr boyd with the magistrate and a constable carrying a candle came out this way sir said the servant and the three crossed the hall and passing close by anthony went up the broad oak staircase that led to the upper rooms then the minutes passed away from upstairs came the noise of doors opening and shutting and footsteps passing overhead from the inner hall the sound of low talking and a few sobs now and again from a frightened maid from sir nicholas room all was quiet except once when mr stewart's laugh high and natural rang out anthony thought of that strong brisk face he had seen in the candlelight and wondered how he could laugh with death so imminent and worse than death and a warmth of admiration and respect glowed at the lad's heart the man by anthony sighed and shifted his feet what is it for whispered the lad at last i mustn't speak to you sir said the man at last the footsteps overhead came to the top of the stairs. The magistrate's voice called out sharply and impatiently, "'Come along, come along!' And the three, all carrying bags and valises, came downstairs again and crossed the hall. Again the door opened as they went in, leaving the luggage on the floor, and Anthony caught another glimpse of the four still seated round the table. But Sir Nicholas' head was bowed upon his hands. Then again the door closed and there was silence. Once more it was flung open, and Anthony saw the interior of the room plainly. The four were standing up. Mr. Stewart was bowing to Lady Maxwell. The magistrate stood close beside him. Then a couple of men stepped up to the young man's side as he turned away, and the three came out into the hall and stood waiting by the little heap of luggage. Mr. Franklin came next, with the manservant close beside him, and the rest of the men behind, and the last closed the door and stood by it. There was a dead silence. 
Anthony sprang to his feet in uncontrollable excitement. What was happening? Again the door opened and the men made room as Mistress Margaret came out and the door shut. She came swiftly across, with her little air of dignity and confidence, towards Anthony, who was standing forward. "'Why, Master Anthony,' she said, "'dear lad, I did not know they had kept you.' And she took his hand. "'What is it? What is it?' he whispered sharply. "'Hush,' she said, and the two stood together in silence. The moments passed. Anthony could hear the quick thumping beat of his own heart and the breathing of Mistress Margaret, but the hall was perfectly quiet, where the magistrate with the prisoner and his men stood in an irregular dark group with the candle behind them, and no sound came from the room beyond. Then the handle turned and a crack of light showed, but no further sound, then the door opened wide a flood of light poured out and sir nicholas tottered into the hall margaret margaret he cried where are you go to her there was a strange moaning sound from the brightly lighted room the old lady dropped anthony's hand and moved swiftly and unfalteringly across and once more the door closed behind her there was a sharp word of command from the magistrate and the sentries from every door left their posts and joined the group which, with Sir Nicholas and his guest and Mr. Boyd in the centre, now passed out through the garden door. The magistrate paused as he saw Anthony standing there alone. "'I can trust you, young gentleman,' he said, "'not to give the alarm till we are gone.' Anthony nodded, and the magistrate passed briskly out onto the terrace, shutting the door behind him. There was a rush of footsteps and a murmur of voices, and the hall was filled with the watching servants. As the chorus of exclamations and inquiries broke out, Anthony ran straight through the crowd to the garden door and on to the terrace. They had gone to the left, he supposed, but he hesitated a moment to listen. Then he heard the stamp of horses' feet and the jingle of saddlery, and saw the glare of torches through the yew hedge, and he turned quickly and ran along the terrace past the flood of light that poured out from the supper-room and down the path that led to the side door opposite the rectory it was very dark and he stumbled once or twice then he came to the two or three stairs that led down to the door in the wall and turned off among the bushes creeping on hands and feet till he reached the wall low on this side but deep on the other and looked over the pursuivants with their men had formed a circle round the two prisoners who were already mounted and who sat looking about them as the luggage was being strapped to their saddles before and behind the bridles were lifted forward over the horses heads and a couple of the guard held each rein the groom who had brought round the two horses for mr stuart and himself stood white-faced and staring with his back to the rectory wall the magistrate was just mounting at a little distance his own horse which was held by the rectory boy mr boyd it seemed was to walk with the men two or three torches were burning by now and every detail was distinct to anthony as he crouched among the dry leaves and peered down onto the group just beneath sir nicholas face was turned away from him but his head was sunk on his breast and he did not stir or lift it as his horse stamped at the strapping on of the valise mr boyd had packed for him mr stuart sat erect and motionless and his face, as Anthony saw it, was confident and fearless. Then suddenly the door in the rectory wall opposite was flung open, and a figure in flying black skirts, but hatless, rushed out and threw the guard straight up to the old man's knee. There was a shout from the men and a movement to pull him off, but the magistrate, who was on his horse and just outside the circle, spoke sharply, and the men fell back. "'Oh, Sir Nicholas! Sir Nicholas!' sobbed the minister his face half buried in the saddle anthony saw his shoulders shaking and his hands clutching at the old man's knee forgive me forgive me there was no answer from sir nicholas he still sat unmoved his chin on his breast as the rector sobbed and moaned at his stirrup there there said the magistrate decidedly over the heads of the guard that is enough mr dent and he made a motion with his hand a couple of men took the minister by the shoulders and drew him still crying out to sir nicholas outside the group and he stood there dazed and groping with his hands there was a word of command and the guard moved off at a sharp walk 
with the horses in the centre and as they turned the lad saw in the torchlight the old man's face drawn and wrinkled with sorrow and great tears running down it the rector leaned against his own wall with his hands over his face and anthony looked at him with growing suspicion and terror as the flare of the torches on the trees faded and the noise of the troop died away round the corner End of chapter eight